Hello, and thank you for joining us for the second of two information sessions on returning to work on campus. This session is intended for all employees, though everyone is welcome here. We're delighted to have this time with you today. My name is Becky Mangini, and I'm the Vice Chancellor for Human Resources and Equal Opportunity and Compliance at Carolina. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues from HR and across the country, to, across the university today, and we hope to use this time together to talk a little bit more about returning to work on campus and the work being done to prepare for a broad scale return on July 19th. We'll discuss the new community standards and the health and safety precautions in place. We'll talk some about your mental health and how to take into consideration the impact has had uh, the, the, the impact of the past year on you and your colleagues. We'll spend some time talking logistics and we'll provide some specific guidance and resources for you to use as you navigate your return. We'll then close the session by collectively answering the questions you submitted when you registered for the event. Before we begin, however, I want to point out that um, because this is a Zoom to YouTube event, um, we are not utilizing the chat function in YouTube today, but rather we'll go ahead and answer the questions you submitted in advance of the event. So please do not go ahead and try to use the chat or quick Q&A section of the YouTube program. That will not work today. I also want to note that this session is being recorded and the recordings will be available on the hr.unc.edu website next week. I want to take a minute first to acknowledge all that we've been through together. This last year, I think it's fair to say, has been a doozy. None of us knew when we made the initial transition last March that it'd be 16 months before we would be back on campus together again. We've all had to pivot and adjust. And actually not just once. We've all suffered loss in some way. And if you're anything like me, there have been times when you've struggled. I get it. And for some of you, the prospect of returning to campus is inducing anxiety, perhaps because to you it feels rushed or because you've just now grown comfortable in the most recent pivot we've made and you're not ready for another one. I get that too. And yet our campus is founded on the notion that we are a robust residential community that depends on and in fact is built on the free exchange of ideas between faculty, staff, and students in a common physical space. The virus caused us to pivot away from that residential and interactive part of our mission temporarily, but now that we better understand the virus and have collectively controlled its spread, the world is opening up and we are being called to redefine the Carolina experience in the new abnormal, as the chancellor likes to say. We'll make this pivot together though. And after today, we hope that you'll be a little bit more prepared for what comes next. Throughout the pandemic, and even before that, we've led with the premise that the well being of our community is paramount. That remains true as we anticipate our return to campus. Many of you saw the email that came out earlier today announcing the updated community standards. Uh, more information will come on these and be posted on the university sites in the coming days, but the key highlights of that are that masks will be required in all indoor spaces on campus and the uh, masks will no longer be required outdoors. The exception to this, and there are a few exceptions, but the main one is that faculty, when and where appropriate, may remove their masks while they're teaching as long as they can maintain a six foot physical distancing. And I should point out that's true for all instructors, whether or not you're a faculty member or an instructor of another sort. We will continue the testing program that will be available to employees on a voluntary basis and all unvaccinated students must participate in the testing program at least once a week. And there will no longer be restrictions on gatherings and classroom spaces and building access, except for number three, where uh, faculty can manage their masks. Some of you I can anticipate are already jumping to the question, what if I'm in my office alone? Can I take my mask off? The answer is yes. What if I'm drinking um, my, my uh, Diet Coke and I need to take my mask off to do so? The answer is yes. We're gonna work through the details of how we manage dining spaces and personal offices and that sort of thing. But we wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to see the community standards as they're framed out for uh, the return on the 19th of July. Beyond the community standards, however, there are several things that you can do to ensure your safety and that of the community when you return. And for more of that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Kathy Brennan from Environment, Health and Safety. Kathy? Thanks, Becky, I appreciate it. Um, so my presentation is gonna focus on workplace safety 
And um, I'm also going to share the most up-to-date CDC guidance, um, some current stats regarding infection and vaccination rates um, locally, and then also highlight some prevention strategies that UNC um, has in place. Next slide. All right, in terms of CDC guidance, so UNC has been following CDC guidance throughout the pandemic. Um, it, as everyone knows, it, it does change, um, but they recently updated their guidance for institutes of higher education at the beginning of June. And specifically, um, they split uh, guidance into two uh, routes where you know everyone is vaccinated or um, colleges and universities where you don't necessarily know if everyone is fully vaccinated. So UNC falls under that. Um, and they specifically say that you need to have multiple factors um, which inform the op optimal implementation of a layered prevention strategy. So I'm gonna go through those later in my presentation. Um, but the primary factors that you need to look at before you do that is the level of community transmission, COVID-19 vaccination coverage, um, whether or not you have a robust screening testing program, and then also um, making sure that you're tracking any local COVID-19 outbreaks or in increasing um, transmission rates. Next slide. So I just wanna share some of the stats, um, current stats uh, locally. Um, so in terms of level community transmission, North Carolina, and this data is from the 28th, um, a couple days ago, but no North Carolina currently has a daily percent positive rate of 2.7%, which is um, quite low and is below the 5% um, rate that we've been tracking um, throughout the pandemic. Orange County is even less. Their 14 day percent positive rate is currently at 0.5% and has been for several weeks. And if we look here at Carolina, um, our Carolina Together testing program since the beginning of June only has a 0.04% positive rate, which is extremely low. Um, and just to let you know um, on some specific numbers, so we've only had two student positives since June 1st, and then three employee self-reports since June 1st. So just like the rest of the country and also North Carolina, we're seeing our rates significantly um, decrease over the last couple months. Next slide. And then in terms of vaccination, um, so if you look at the table um, on the slide there, in the United States, um, you know, we're currently out about 46% of the total population is fully vaccinated and about 54% is partially vaccinated. Um, here in North Carolina, it's a little less, so 42% fully and 45% partially. But if you look um, closer to home in Orange County, we are actually one of the strongest counties in the state in terms of vaccinations. We're currently at 62% fully vaccinated and 64% partially vaccinated. Um, so for vaccination coverage locally, we are um, very strong and that's a good sign for us. Um, if we have launched an employee self report form and we've only received about 27% um, of employees reporting that they're vaccinated, but uh, we assume that this is probably uh, much lower than what is real. real. Um, we are assuming that we're probably around 50%. Um, I do wanna let people know um, if you haven't reported your vaccination yet, vaccination status is never shared with um, your supervisor or with departments. We really are using this for a broad picture of our campus rate. So I would uh, definitely encourage you if you have not done it to um, log in to that link below. You can also find this on the Carolina Together website and self-report that you've been vaccinated. That will really help us um, get a better picture of our vaccination coverage at UNC. Next slide. So in terms of the layered prevention strategies that the CDC has recommended and that UNC has implemented, um, the number one strategy is offering and promoting vaccinations. That's the best way to protect yourself. Uh, there's two um, clinics that you can go to on campus if you haven't been vaccinated yet and go get a vaccine. One at the Friday Center run by UNC Health and then Campus Health is also um, giving vaccines at their student stores pharmacy and anyone can go there, students, faculty, or staff. So we would definitely encourage you to stop by if you haven't been vaccinated yet. 
Um, I'm sure most of you have seen that the students are attesting to their vaccination status as part of their registration for the fall. And as I mentioned, we're encouraging employees to self-report vaccination as well. Um, and then we do have designated leave provisions um, in order for you to obtain a vaccine or even to deal with side effects. And those provisions have been extended. Um, so again, that's the number one thing that we would encourage you to do is, is go get vaccinated if you can be. Um, in terms of masking, um, so we do have a mask mandate inside all university buildings that just came, um, we're gonna continue that. It just came out in the community standards. This is more conservative than the state, um, county or town in terms of fully vaccinated individuals, but we think it's best at this time period. It will be reevaluated um, every couple of weeks um, and could change, but um, we do believe that we should have a mask mandate inside um, currently. In terms of physical distancing, uh, we are gonna continue to promote that through signage, even though that's being eliminated. Um, so you can continue to practice that if you want. And then for hand washing and respiratory etiquette, uh, we again promote that through signage. We're making sure that we have enhanced cleaning in our bathrooms um, to ensure that we have uh, soap and paper towels that are stocked so people can wash their hands. And then also have the hand sanitizer stations and hand sanitizer um, throughout campus. Next slide. Um, contact tracing. So we've done this throughout the pandemic. So if we know of a positive, um, we are gonna do a case investigation and contact trace um, so that we can tell others if they've been around that positive individual. And we also will isolate and quarantine um, that positive individual. Campus health is the lead for students and the employee health clinic does this for employees. And we'll continue to do that um, just like we have throughout the pandemic. And then in terms of the testing, um, I mentioned the Carolina Together testing program earlier. Uh, this is the screening or surveillance testing that is available to everyone on campus um, if you want to go get tested. Um, symptomatic students can go to campus health if they're symptomatic and then employees, um, if you're symptomatic, you should contact your primary care provider for access to testing. So the surveillance and screening testing is for asymptomatic um, testing if you just wanna be tested um, just in case. And then in terms of, we've had a lot of questions about our buildings and maintaining healthy environments. Um, so facilities services has implemented enhanced cleaning procedures throughout the pandemic. They are um, reducing those just a bit, but. Uh, they are going to con still consider, um, excuse me, continue enhanced cleaning in our buildings. And they've also been um, looking at ventilation of buildings. They have um, made sure that all building HVAC systems are performing as designed. They've increased air rates um, if it's possible for that system. And then they've also upgraded all of the building box filters um, to higher efficiency filters, MERV 13. Um, to ensure that we have the best air quality in the buildings. And then finally, just maintaining healthy operations, um, which includes you know, having communications, uh, supportive policies, health equity. Um, we continue to try to push out as much um, information as we receive it, new guidelines to the uh, Carolina Together website. And then we also have individual department and unit COVID websites. For example, EHS has one, facility services has one. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to check out those websites as well as Carolina Together. Next slide. So finally, I just wanna leave um, you with a couple tips for workplace safety. Uh, my number one tip is, you know, go get vaccinated. Uh, vaccination is the best way to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Um, so if you haven't gotten your vaccine yet, I would definitely encourage you to research that and um, go get a vaccine if you can. And then um, one of the other things is make sure you do understand what the UNC community standards are and that you are following those in the workplace. I mentioned, um, for example, the mask mandate is um, UNC's is different than what some of the current um, local mask mandates are. So you wanna make sure you're in compliance with that while you're at the workplace. Um, and then also you can always be more conservative than our community standards. So we don't have a mask mandate outside, for example, but if you wanna wear a mask at all times, even when you're outside, you know, go ahead and do that and you should feel comfortable um, doing that. 
And um, finally, I'm sure everyone already knows this, but the guidance changes on a daily basis sometimes. Um, so make sure that you're keeping up with those current trends and uh, closely following UNC guidance um, because community, we do anticipate that the community standards could change um, again in the future. And um, I think that's all I had. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy, for these comments and for your leadership, both in anticipation of a broad scale return and in support of those who have been on campus throughout. We owe you and them an enormous debt of gratitude. I open today's session by acknowledging the difficulties of the past 16 months. That's not to say there haven't been wins too. That we pivoted an organization this large and not only kept the institution moving, but helped it and its people thrive is really amazing. And that's thanks to all of you. We learned to use tech, new technology. We figured out that more than a few meetings probably could have been better managed as emails. And we were forced to think of new ways to deliver on our business purposes. As we return, we know that not everyone is in the same place. And we know that the last year has been tough for lots of reasons well beyond the pandemic as well. It's important that you all consider the mental well being of yourselves and that of your colleagues as we anticipate the return. And to help us along on that front, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nadia Shargia, an associate professor in the UNC Department of Psychiatry and the director of the Taking Care of Our Own program. Dr. Shargia? Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, true words were never spoken. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. So I just wanna take a little bit of time today just to make sure we're, we're coming together around the similar message and the similar understanding. First, I wanna state that it is normal to feel apprehensive and to feel many different feelings, some of which may, we may not always be able to readily recognize or identify. But we've been living in a world that has seemed almost foreign to us for over a year, a world that has required constant change in all parts of our lives. And this year has beyond been dominated by so many external forces, decisions that have left us fatigued when often there have not been any absolute rights or wrongs of how to make these decisions or what is even the best decision. We have felt so many things, so many feels. <laughs> it could be nervous. We felt scared at times. We may still be feeling some of these feelings. We may also be feeling other things like being fragile or overwhelmed. Yet, we did this. We figured it out. Many of us didn't even realize we were recognizing and solving problems, but we were. And there's merit in that to embrace and not forget. We learned a lot. We learned a lot about ourselves, a lot about our families, sometimes more than we want to know about our families if we perhaps bubble together. But we also learned more about our needs. We adapted and we changed. And it is important for us to recognize these strengths, to stop and acknowledge where we have been, but also embrace where we are at this moment and take that into consideration when we think about where we're going next. There are learning points about ourselves in all of our realms, our professional world, our personal world, our social world, and we can strive to apply these learning points as we're shifting again. I know change can be bittersweet. I know there are many concerns or worries that any of us are having about the upcoming change, excuse me, and, and that's okay too. Anxiety or stress is uncomfortable, but it can also be helpful. It can help us adapt. It can help us prepare. There's also benefit though in trying to understand where the anxiety is coming from and, and why we feel this way, what underlies it for any of us. Because the what and the why, even though the experience itself may be common, how we got there is very unique to each and every one of us. Next slide, please. So there are steps that we can all try to take to help ourselves and those around us move through and adapt to the ongoing current changes. Being flexible is key, both with ourselves and with others. Decisions that are made for one situation may not work for everyone. We're all coming from so many varying places and backgrounds. We have different motivations. We have different needs. 
one may not be able to guess or anticipate what is important to one versus what might or might not be important to another. So flexibility when and where we can find it is key to any period of transition and change. And that means being flexible, not just with ourselves, but with those around us. And then acknowledge, acknowledge what you're feeling rather than deny it. It's important that we validate ourselves and how we're feeling. We often deny our needs and feelings and we can belittle them, but we actually do better when we can cut ourselves some slack. I often ask folks in conversation, would you give yourself the same advice that you give to your friends? Unfortunately, the answer is it's different usually, but should it be? It's important to acknowledge that we are just as deserving, that we deserve to show the same kindness and compassion we show to others to ourselves. And we actually feel better when we do this. And then communicate. We need to talk about how we're doing and, and what we need. Others can't guess or assume as much as we sometimes think they should know. Talking, opening up, asking questions will bring about understanding that can help change just more unknowns to knowns. It helps people understand us better, which can help then identify ways to understand what are problems and what can be possible solutions. But I also want to remind to communicate means that not only are we talking, but we're also listening. I encourage all when someone asks, how are you doing? Be honest with your answer. And when you ask someone how they are doing as well, be open and try to listen. Embracing optimism where we can, can also go a long way. I know change is hard. We can all embrace that truth, but there can be benefit and there can be good on the other end. Sometimes it can help to reduce our stress if we can work to embrace hope for positive outcomes. There's a, a wealth of research that embraces positive psychology. We have learned so much and come so far this year and not everything was rosy and not everything was wonderful, but not everything was as bad as often we feared or worried that it might be. And my own sense of optimism with times of change, well, there's opportunity for improvement and that's something to hold on to. And then to stay present. It can take work, but there is merit in trying to avoid losing ourselves to the what ifs. To try and focus on the what that is in front of us instead of anticipating the what ifs that might occur. Worry can be a consuming emotion. It can deplete our emotional energy. We benefit from defining as many knowns as possible, and that can help alleviate a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety because we can practice more acceptance. I encourage those around me and I encourage myself as well to spend time thinking about what gets my stress, but what deserves my stress? Because often those are two separate things. And often I find myself getting in that, my own spiral of the what ifs um, that often don't deserve my stress because they're not the real. I hope we can all embrace and come together the learning points from this past year and avoid automatically falling back into old habits that may not be our best habits. Relying on our old habits can mean that we're not focusing on the helpful things that we've learned about ourselves, our workflow, our motivations, and we can bring those insights into this next phase of our lives. Now is a time to put trust in ourselves and also trust in those around us as we move from the here and the now and we get to the where we're going. Thank you for the opportunity and time to meet with all today. Thank you so much, Dr. Shargia. That these are excellent points for all of us to consider. And I personally can't tell you how important it was to hear these things at this moment. And now to brass tacks. Not surprisingly, many of the questions you all asked prior today's, to today's session were about logistics. You wanted to know about parking and bus transportation. You wanted to know if the tents on campus will stay up. And the answer to that one is yes. And you wanted to know about things like ADA accommodations, should you or members of your team need them. 
Cheryl Stout is here from Transportation and Parking, and Elizabeth Hall is here from the EOC office to walk us through some of these things. Cheryl and Elizabeth. Thank you, Becky. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just covering a, a few things relative to parking and transportation. So um, for those returning um, during the July 19th, the 31st, um, this is the tail end of this academic year, this annual year permit cycle. But permit, parking permits are available. Um, the best thing that you can do is that if you want on-campus parking is to communicate with your parking coordinator within your department. Um, those parking coordinators liaison with transportation and parking and they have available parking um, or have parking assignments within the department and can reach out to us as well. Um, once those assignments coordinators have made those assignments, each employee will receive an email um, to log into the system and to pay for their permit online and to register their license plate. Um, just a reminder for those that haven't been on campus, we do now have virtual permits, so there won't be a hang tag permit, it will be virtual. But once you've logged in, registered li your license plate, um, you will be fine to park in the um, parking zone that your coordinator is designed being assigned. If you have, um, if you are coming back and you're coming back three days or less, um, you'll want to, if your parking coordinator doesn't automatically know that, you will want to indicate to them that you're on a um, reduced schedule of reporting and let them know that that's three days or less a week. Um, and then you will be assigned a flex permit, um, which is at a reduced cost. For the 21-22 academic year, that registration process is underway. Your parking coordinators and your departments should be working on those assignments for the fall. Um, those permits will become valid August 1st. Um, so again, your parking coordinator is always your best resource for, um, for your department. Um, of course, you'll be, able, you'll be eligible for payroll deduction for your annual permit. And again, the flex rate will be available um, for employees that report to campus three days or a week or, or less. Um, just for parking accommodation, so um, uh, transit will be available. Um, Chapel Transit, Go Triangle, Part, all of those agencies will, will be operating and those transit services available. Um, but if for some reason you need an accommodation, including um, just inability to take uh, public transit now, there is a process to apply um, for uh, a parking accommodation. So there's a link to that through this website and um, would recommend that we have a committee, the Transportation and Parking Accessibility Committee um, that reviews those applications on, um, every two weeks. So if you need an accommodation relative to transportation and parking, that would be the process that you would go through. Um, that's my update. If you need additional information or contact, please again, your parking coordinators are a resource and move.unc.edu is a resource. And um, we also have um, email that you can send questions directly to us. So thank you. If we can advance to the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about accommodations outside of those for parking. Um, as we have throughout the pandemic, uh, the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office will continue to facilitate accommodations for employees with disabilities that are impacted by COVID-19. Um, and at this, at this point, those are employees who are unable to be vaccinated because they have a disability that prevents vaccination. Um, employees who are able to be vaccinated, but who have a disability that um, may cause the, the vaccine to be less effective or, or still present an ongoing concern. Um, and then employees who are unvaccinated and have a disability that makes them um, at greater risk of COVID-19. Um, as, as has been the case throughout the pandemic, EOC is only able to provide accommodations based on the health need of you as the employee. So not, um, no, not providing accommodations based on needs of family members or folks you live with. One change I do wanna highlight um, from how we've done this uh, up to this point in the pandemic is that um, at this point, we do need you as the employee requesting an accommodation to submit documentation from your medical provider of the health reason um, that you need the accommodation. Um, and it's, um, we need you to ensure that your medical provider is filling out those forms completely and giving us all the information that we need to assess the request. So please do um, 
take a look at those forms before you give them to your doctor and, and make sure that they're filling them out thoroughly um, before they send them back our way. Um, those forms, um, as well as all, all this information is on EOC's um, COVID-19 accommodations page. You'll see on that page that we had asked folks to submit um, requests by June 28th, which is three weeks out from the return. We are still reviewing them. You can still submit them. Um, even if you miss that deadline, that's, that's not a problem. Just please be aware we may need to do a temporary accommodation. You may not get a final decision by July 19th um, if, if we get them close, close to that date. We are reviewing them on a weekly basis though as they come in. So, so if you haven't already and you think you may need an accommodation, go ahead and submit that. Next slide, please. So in addition to um, transportation parking and the EOC office, there are several other resources we wanna highlight for everybody as we're making this shift back to on-campus work. Um, the first is just about the practical day-to-day -day work operations and that's ITS. They are available to be meeting with folks now through July 19th to meet with you on campus, make sure all your devices are working, everything's ready for you to come back um, and be all set in July. We do encourage you to go ahead and make an appointment with them before July 19th, if you can, just so that they have time to get to everybody. Um, EAP, the Employee Assistance Program, continues to be a resource for folks, and we continue to have the full range of services that we've always offered through that program, but I did want to just highlight um, that their EAP counselors are available 24 hours a day and they can deal, they can help you with a number of things that folks may be dealing with um, as we're, um, you know, as we've, we've dealt with the past 15 months and as you're transitioning back and managing all the, the stress that can come with that. Um, another on-campus resource is employment and management relations. They're able to help you um, talk through any concerns that you may have with your supervisor or peers or just on a personal level as you're headed back into the office, any issues that come up. They're also able to help identify trainings and professional development that may be um, helpful if you're facing challenges as you're coming back to the workplace. So we encourage you to reach out to them um, as, as needed. And finally, but certainly not least, um, your manager is a resource to you in all of this. We spent some time yesterday with the campus's managers and supervisors, encouraging them and equipping them to lead with compassion and transparency and open communication. And that's a, that's a two-way street. So we hope that y'all will go to them if you need them. Um, there's a couple of particular areas where they may be able to support you. One is that they are able to approve um, short-term flexible locations or flexible schedules for things that come up like childcare or elder care needs. Those should be 30 days or less. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A, but they are available for those, those short-term needs. Um, they're also available to help you manage your schedule so that you can take advantage of some of the wellness resources and programming that's um, available on campus. Um, we want folks to you know, have that time built in to, to take advantage of those resources and, and get the support that they're needing. Um, and we've encouraged managers to, to help you build that into your day as you need. So please, please contact them for, for help in that regard. And I will turn it back over to Becky for the Q&A. Excellent, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and to you, Cheryl, as well. So now what? You've got the information, what should you do with it? Well, the short answer is use it to help sort of navigate and prepare for a return on the July on July 19th. Um, there's a lot more to that though, and I get that. And we'll talk a little bit more about your questions in a second. We met yesterday with managers and supervisors as Elizabeth noted and shared much of the same information with them. We suggested that they hold meetings upon return with all of you to discuss logistics, like how meetings will work in your individual offices, how the office functions will happen in the new abnormal. We encourage them to talk with their teams about how you all are feeling, about what you're excited about and what makes people anxious about returning to the office. We've advised them, as Elizabeth said, to lead by creating an atmosphere of patience, kindness, and empathy. And we advise the same for all of you. This is yet another transition in a year of lots of them. And we're not all in the same place. 
uh, while we've all experienced the pandemic together, we've not all been impacted in the same ways. And that will likely show some in how we return. Some employees are ready, some are not. Some of you wanna work from home permanently and don't understand why if you've been successful at home, you need to come back at all. Some of you are anxious about your safety while others have concerns about the racial climate on campus. All of these things and all of these feelings are understandable. And we want you to have a place to voice them as we navigate our return and to know that you're not alone. We have lots of resources available to help and we'll continue to post more on the hr.unc.edu return to campus work, uh, return to on, Return to work on campus website. There we go. Also, while masks are required in all indoor spaces initially, we also want to support and encourage an environment where employees have agency in their feelings of safety. If wearing a mask, as Kathy said, outdoors feels best for some people, great. If going off site to lunch makes someone on your team anxious, raise your hand and talk through what might work better. And likewise, if there are things we can be doing in the office that borrow from the lessons we learned during the pandemic, what are they and how do we make them happen? These conversations do not and cannot always be led by your supervisor as he or she won't always know what you're feeling or what your thoughts of the issues are. Please speak up. You're a really, really important part of setting the tone for how we return successfully. And we want you to be well positioned to do so. And we recognize that a lot of this is hard and fun and scary all at once. Together, we get to help define the new abnormal for Carolina, and we're here to help. As I said, there are lots of resources available, and our colleagues, as Elizabeth noted, in ENMR stand by at the ready to help assist you as you navigate the weeks and months ahead. And with that, let's transition to the most important part of the program, your questions. I want to start by saying we reviewed the questions you all submitted. There are far more than we can get to in the remaining 24 minutes, so we have chunked them into themes, and we're going to try to go ahead and address them. We're gonna also make sure that we continue to provide updates on that website, like I said, um, because we're not gonna get to all of them today. So please check back often. And as Kathy noted, some of the guidance and some of the news is changing regularly. So if we have to make changes to these, we'll let you know just as quickly as we can. So I'm gonna jump in. The way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna read a question if it's an HR or a general question, I will likely answer it. If it belongs in sort of the uh, bailiwick of somebody who was one of our presenters today, I'll punt it to them. So um, let me start with the first one, which is a question I've heard a lot. Why, when we have been successful working remotely, do we have to come back on July 19th? What's the push for having us come back so early? Why not August or some September? Totally fair question. Um, but also one that I think I started by addressing, and I, I will sort of repeat what I said, and that is the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill was founded on the very notion that we are a community of learners who really work best when there is a free exchange of ideas between faculty, staff, and students in a residential community. Could that change? Sure, it sort of did during the pandemic, but it was temporary. Were we successful? Remarkably. Should it stay that way in exactly the same fashion moving forward? We're not sure. And I think it's a fair question. We are anticipating uh, bringing back the largest freshman class we've ever had on campus. And we're going to bring back a sophomore class, most of whom have never been on step foot on campus. We're gonna have 30,000 students in, uh, on campus this fall. And the idea that we can, while we've been successful working remotely, continue to deliver on our mission while continuing to work at a full capacity of remote seems a little bit presumptive. And here's an example I'll give. It's not going to answer all of your questions, but here's an example. I was talking to a colleague in the libraries who said, you know, one of the things that's worked remarkably well during the pandemic is we started doing online uh, sessions with, um, with students to be able to do their library um, research, to, to sort of make an initial inquiry. And they have been totally successful and the students love it. That's fantastic. It's the super, but we have 3,500 students on campus and a whole bunch of people remote. And now we're gonna be back in a residential setting with 30,000 students here. Do we know whether all 30,000 students will still choose to do an online library visit or do we think that maybe it's going to be a bunch of people want to come into the library and spend some time working with a librarian in person to do some of the initial inquiry and then others will continue to do online. 
let's assess what that breakdown is and then build our workforce to match it, as opposed to making the assumption that we can go entirely online. Now, many of you are gonna to say to me, but my job is not one of being an institutional librarian. Totally get it. But I think if we go back to the fact that our core mission is pro uh, providing the free exchange of ideas in a residential community, we all uh, accepted jobs that were part of that mission with a residential focus. And so we're gonna go back to that. It's not gonna look exactly the same as it did pre-pandemic. There's no doubt things will be different for all of the reasons we discussed today. And I'm hoping we can learn from some of the things that we did during the pandemic. Um, and I'm hoping some of those meetings no longer have to be meetings, but we can make them emails, in fact. Um, but I, I think the idea is that just because we were all remote and we were successful that way doesn't mean that that's a full fit for when we come back. The next part of that question is why do we need pilot programs and who can participate in those? Today's session is really about the return. Um, so we're gonna spend less time talking about the pilot programs, but it is true there is a, a, a pilot being offered to that we sent out to deans and vice chancellors to ask them to review at their request, um, to review their workforce and identify areas where the business need might be such that some people could have flexible schedules um, or work locations um, to meet the business need. And we could test some things that we might put in place in a longer term um, when we look at a more flexible uh, work arrangements policy moving forward. Uh, the deans and vice chancellors have been working on submitting those. Those are to be driven at the uh, business unit level, not by the individual employees, because we're trying to figure out things like how do we build the infrastructure to support a hybrid model? Right now, if some people have been really successful working from home, but they took their chairs and their computers. And if they want to work on site two days and then work from home three days, how do we manage if they don't have a chair and a computer? Um, likewise, we've got uh, the questions of parking that Cheryl talked about earlier, or what do we do with the technology about having some people on site and some people remote, and then how do we ensure there are mentorship opportunities or professional growth opportunities. We've got to figure some of that out before we look at a broader scale program. All right, so the next question is, how will you make sure that people who work in cubicle environments are safe, and what about crowded work environments? Well, as you know, and as Kathy talked about a little bit, the guidance has changed pretty dramatically over time. And we continue to hear from our public health experts that the single best way we can keep ourselves and our community safe are to be vaccinated and wear a mask. So cubicle environments are less of a concern. There are no physical distancing requirements here or as largely part of the CDC guidance moving forward. Um, but if if uh, individuals are concerned, the idea that we have a mask requirement should help. Um, and uh, again, the biggest piece of advice we can give is that people get um, vaccinations. Now, if this remains a concern for you, we encourage you to talk to your supervisor. Um, having concerns about the safety of your space is not, uh, not a reason to um, coordinate a remote work arrangement, but there may be plans that your supervisor can make to see if there's another location in your in your building. There may be an opportunity to arrange regular breaks so you can step outside and take your mask down. Uh, there are lots of other ways you can work with your supervisor to ensure that your well being is taken into consideration as you navigate the return. Um, somebody asks about will any PPE or protection continue to be provided to on campus employees? When will we be contacted by our individual departments with specific instructions on how to return? Um, so we have asked individual departments to continue to or to reach out to employees with plans moving forward. Uh, several people have asked about the provision of plexiglass. That is not something we anticipate uh, providing uh, in work units moving forward. Um, and uh, Kathy, I'm going to defer to you to, to answer whether or not there's any additional PPE being delivered on campus in the uh, in the fall. Sure. So the community protective equipment that was passed out kind of at the beginning of the pandemic with the Carolina branded masks, um, we are not going to be providing those in the future. Um, if, if your PPE is required for your specific work that you do, so for example, if you work in a healthcare setting, um, we would be providing that PPE, um, but that's true whether or not there's a pandemic or not. Um, so none of the community protective equipment, um, like I said, that was passed out earlier is anticipated to be provided anymore. Thank you, Kathy. 
The next question is one, uh, it says, how are we dealing with staff who need to share offices or open cubicle spaces and we don't know if everyone is vaccinated? And is there a way to make mandatory testing um, available for staff who are not vaccinated? This is an excellent question. Um, and as Kathy noted, um, or actually, I don't know whether she noted it or not, we are, we are not allowed to ask people if they're vaccinated. People can self attest and we are asking people to attest whether or not they've been va uh, vaccinated, but we cannot ask them uh, directly if they have been vaccinated and you are not to ask your colleagues that uh, in the uh, workspace. So the truth of the matter is you won't know if everyone's vaccinated. Your best protection, again, uh, from our public health experts is for you yourself to be vaccinated and to wear a mask. Now, the other thing that I, the other piece of advice I can give is um, many of you have read the numbers. The student attestations are up over 90% for the number of, among the students who have attested. And the students are going to be required to vaccinate or to test if they're not vaccinated. Right now, as Kathy noted, we only have about 27% of employees who have noted uh, that they have been vaccinated. The single best piece of advice I can give you is to go in and test yourself. And if you know others or have friends and are talking to people about the return, encourage them to visit that site because the best way, we know that this is one of the biggest areas of concern for people. They're concerned about not knowing who's been vaccinated and how many employees have been vaccinated. We can see that number go up every time somebody goes in and attests. And whether they work in your unit or not, you'll be able to see that more employees on campus are vaccinated if they go into the site. So we had a call with the deans the other day. I asked them to reach out to their groups. We'll continue to send messages from the center, but anything you can do to get you yourselves and your friends to attest in the site that you have been vaccinated should help us understand the full level of vaccination. And we hope for all of you provide a little bit uh, of, uh, um, of a sense of where we stand and perhaps reduce some of that anxiety. Unfortunately, there is no way uh, for us to make uh, testing mandatory for those who are not vaccinated because we are not allowed under uh, state policy to ask whether who, to make a requirement for vaccination and or to create a, uh, a requirement that's associated with a, a policy of that sort. So there will not be required testing uh, for staff who are not vaccinated, though we would encourage anybody, any employee who wishes to receive asymptomatic testing to go ahead and do so. I'm going to throw one more question uh, over to my colleagues in parking, and then uh, I'm going to ask Elizabeth Hall to pick up the um, monitoring of questions after that. Cheryl, this one's for you. For employees who take public transit to campus, will lowered capacities on those um, options be considered when negotiating whether an employee can remain uh, remote longer? And will employees be pay forced to pay for parking if they can no longer take public transit due to reduced capacities? Um, many employees take public transit uh, because they can't afford to park on campus and there seems to be some reduction of routes which makes returning somewhat difficult. So um, through the, the 19th through the 30th, there will, uh, Chapel Transit will continue to run 14 of the 21 uh, typical routes that they run. Um, they will be serving um, primary parking rides like the Friday Center, um, Estes, um, and Southern Village. Um, so those, those parking rides will be available. There, there is no social distancing on buses. Um, as of now, so since May, there's been no social distancing. However, masks are still required. Um, so we will continue to have those transit services beginning August 1st, Chapel Transit will return um, to their, their normal routes. All of their routes will be operating um, with some frequency, uh, perhaps frequency impacts um, uh, initially as we begin the new year. But yes, the transit will be operating. If you choose to park on campus, then yes, um, per the ordinance, parking um, parking comes at a fee and you will need to talk to your parking coordinator to ensure what parking availability is on campus. If you have um, a COVID related reason why you can't use transit, then I would uh, again recommend you look for those, um, uh, look at the COVID, um, uh, the opportunities for COVID consideration for 
um, not being able to use the transportation system. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, we have a couple more questions about masks that I think a lot of folks have. So we'll go ahead and address those. Uh, the first one is, are masks required even for those who are vaccinated? And the answer to that is yes. Um, masks are going to be required um, for everyone indoors, subject to the, the few except, exceptions that um, Becky and Kathy mentioned. Um, Another question that, we, that we've heard a lot is what happens if people don't wear their mask when they are asked to do so? Um, and so part of, part of the thinking in making this a community standard is that we don't want folks to have to be asking people to wear masks. Um, it's it's going to be the expectation across the board. Um, that said, if, if someone comes into your office, into your classroom, into your space and is not wearing a mask, um, you know, we don't want you to have to feel like you are the ones um, enforcing that in any way. You certainly can politely remind folks of the community standards and ask that they put their mask on. Or you can talk with your supervisor um, or ENMR if you, if you need support in, in ensuring someone is wearing a mask in your space. But again, you know, that um, would just remind everyone there that um, taking those steps for yourself, getting the vaccine if you're able, and um, wearing your own mask are going to provide a lot of the prevention and protection that, that you need. Um, so I think uh, we've got a couple more questions for EHS, and it looks like Kathy is still on. So Kathy, a couple questions for you. Um, what is being done to improve the ventilation in university offices? And um, I think you touched on this, this one, but if you could talk about any extra cleaning of buildings and offices in, in high traffic areas now that um, traffic's gonna be increased on campus. Sure. Um, so I mentioned in my presentation about um, facilities, services, really taking a, a deep dive and look at our HVAC systems and all our buildings and where they can make improvements um, for the air change rate um, and also filtration, they have done that. They'll continue to um, keep an eye on those as we open up um, to make sure that our air quality is as good as it can be in the buildings. And then in terms of um, cleaning, so the CDC has updated their disinfection and cleaning guideline, guidelines for workplaces, um, which, uh, basically it has uh, reduced the amount of disinfection that you have to do. Um, so we are not doing as much as we were doing at the beginning of the pandemic, but we still are doing enhanced cleaning. Um, so enhanced cleaning is those um, high touch areas. So when you think of elevator buttons, um, doorknobs, those sorts of things, they are still gonna continue to do that enhanced cleaning throughout the day. Great, thank you. Um, so another question that we got was, where can we go if we have concerns about the safety of our work environment without the risk of retribution? Uh, will there be designated individuals at the department level to go to for safety concerns and questions? Um, as we've sort of mentioned throughout this presentation, we spent some time yesterday talking with supervisors and managers and really setting the expectation that as we come back to campus, there should be an environment of open communication, um, compassion and understanding, but not everyone is in the same place. Not everyone is having, um, feels the same way about their personal safety. Um, so it's, it's gonna take time and we need to be understanding um, and open to where everybody is and, and treat each other with some kindness and understanding. Um, so all of that is to say, for most units, the, the designated individual to take and address safety concerns is gonna be the manager, unless your manager has communicated that there's someone else in the office or unit that, that is handling that. Um, if, however, there is a concern, you feel you're not able to go to your manager or supervisor or you're, you're not getting the information that you need, you can certainly go to either ENMR or EHS, depending on what the what the particular safety concern is. Um, if if the safety concern relates to a disability that you have, you can certainly, um, you know, we would we would encourage you to come to the EOC to talk through what accommodation options might be uh, possible. 
Um, I think we've got one more parking question if Cheryl's uh, still with us. Um, I plan to work remotely two days a week and three days a week in the office. So I want a partial parking pass. What happens if for some reason I know I need to go in for a meeting um, over three days, like two, a couple extra days a week? Will I be charged extra if I have the flexible pass? So yes, the permit, the flex permit is only for three days or less on campus. So if you come in four days a week or come in five days, then you're not eligible for the flex pass for a schedule. If that happens very rarely, um, like typically you work three days from home every week and then sometime, you know, just one week, then there are daily um, options and hourly options on campus. And yes, that would be in addition to the permit. Thanks. Um, all right, so another question we got um, in, in early March 2020, my director agreed that I could telecommute one day a week. Will that agreement still be honored? Will telecommuting schedules in place before the pandemic um, uh, still be honored? Um, so as Becky mentioned, um, division leaders received um, information about participating in the pilot program and part of the instructions for that for submitting um, participation in that program was that division leaders were um, told to include any prior arrangements that they wanted to continue in their pilot program submission. It was in their discretion to include it. Um, so you'll be notified by your division leadership if your um, prior arrangement was included um, and will be continued as part of the pilot program. Um, outside of that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, if you have short-term needs less than 30 days, you can continue to work with your supervisor on those. Um, Another, another question I, I think maybe on folks' mind, um, are there plans in place for another possible pivot if there is another outbreak due to variants or return of students to the area? Totally fair question. I think if we've learned anything from the last 15, 16 months, it's that we, um, it can be hard to predict what's gonna happen next. But I think we've also learned um, that the best thing that we can do is continue to listen to our public health experts, listen to the guidance that they provide, follow the most current science and make decisions based on that. Um, so the university is continuing to hold regular advisory group meetings, um, both campus and community advisory groups and our public health experts. I know that the public health experts are continuing to meet with leadership on a weekly basis. And so any changes to our community standards or operations will be guided by input from those folks and by those regular ongoing meetings. Um, so we certainly hope that we're able to have a full on-campus uh, fall semester, but if the science and our public health leaders um, point us in another direction, there, there are ongoing conversations to make sure we know that as, as soon as possible. Um, so I think the, the last question here as we wrap up is, will the university develop remote, a remote work policy? Um, if so, how is it assessing what that will look like and when can we expect that to be in place? Um, as Becky said or alluded to, we are using the fall to assess this new normal and what it would take to get an infrastructure for a larger hybrid um, campus operations in place. Um, we have folks um, across HR, across units who are talking about these questions and thinking through what this might look like. Um, and we certainly encourage you to provide feedback to your HR, to um, groups that are, are working on this policy on um, you know, how, how folks are using your services as we transition back to campus and how things are operating. Um, I think that you can expect more information about um, the development of, of any policy or um, um, plans for post-fall. Um, there, there should be updates about that on the HR website. Um, so more to come on that, um, but that is something that we are in conversation about. So I, I see that it is getting close to our time here. So I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to um, 
to talk with us today, to submit your questions, to, to give us some of your time. Um, we really look forward to being back on campus with you. I know the times that I've been back on campus, it's been a little bit overwhelming, but also wonderful to see colleagues and just past folks in the hall again. And so I hope that even um, in the midst of concerns you may have, that, that you can look forward to that piece as well. I hope that you'll take advantage of the resources that we've talked about today and reach out to us with questions or concerns um, as they come up. Um, have a great day, everybody.